Almost 40 years ago, a man named Walter Pepke had a dream of the well-rounded individual. Successful in business, conversant with the arts, sensitive to the beauties of nature, and fit of body. The Aspen Idea, as some people called it, took the form of the Aspen Institute for Humanistic Studies seminars for business people who came up to Aspen to be exposed to literature, philosophy, the arts, music, and the beauty of the Rockies. The Health Center was the first of its kind to recognize the need for physical health among business people decades before such terms as corporate wellness and executive fitness became buzzwords. The Health Center was too far ahead of its time to really succeed, but the life of the body has finally gotten the attention of the modern business person. The advent of the electronic office has brought with it huge increases in not only productivity, but stress levels. Fortunately, this has been accompanied by an unprecedented interest in physical fitness and health. On a massive scale, people have been discovering that athletic activity can not only alleviate stress, but enhance one's health, looks, and general feeling of well-being, not to mention the fact that it feels good and it's fun. We're going to be exploring a tool which can not only deal directly with the stresses of the workplace, but also the stresses that athletic activity entails. That tool is massage. My name is Joseph Meyer, and we're going to be taking a look at the Swedish massage that I learned at the Boulder School of Massage Therapy and have taught to students in Aspen, Boulder, Berlin, Denver, Copenhagen, and Iceland. Swedish massage is so named because it was developed by a Swedish fencing master toward the end of the 18th century. His name was Pier Ling. And the purposes of the movements are basically to knead the toxins, such as lactic acid, which build up in the muscles in exercise, out of those tissues so they don't cause as much soreness, and also to help pump the venous blood back toward the heart. The tape is divided into nine parts. We've divided the body into nine different parts. At some point, you may wish to view the tape in its entirety, but you'll probably find you learn the fastest if you focus on one section at a time until you've learned it. If you repeat and repeat and repeat both viewing and listening to the tape and visualizing the movements and actually practicing them, that's how you'll get the information memorized in your mind so that you can then teach it to your body. But practice is what is going to allow you to really get the information where you can use it. You'll want to review the anatomy of each of the parts of the body as you work with it. A couple of books that I recommend are Wynne Capet's Anatomy Coloring Book, as well as the Color Atlas and Textbook of Human Anatomy, Volume 1, The Locomotor System by Werner Plotzer. It's an indestructible little paperback. I've dragged this one around for years, and it's got very clear text and pictures. Another wonderful text is Touching by Ashley Montague. In addition to the VCR, you'll need a number of other items an oil bottle. It's good if you can open and close it with one hand. If you don't, I can guarantee it'll hit the floor, especially if you've got expensive carpeting. I don't like to use baby oil or other mineral oil because it enters the bloodstream and starts to destroy B vitamins. You're really safe with anything you find in the kitchen. I prefer cold-pressed sweet almond oil with a bit of olive oil, vitamin E, and lecithin. Before proceeding further, I'd like to address some of the contraindications of massage. You don't ever want to work on anybody who could even possibly have an embolism, that's a blood clot, any other cardiovascular disease, any kind of an injury, or a possibly communicable skin disease until you've conferred with that person's physician. You want to stay away from the throat and the area underneath the ear because there's some delicate structures in there. Don't get carried away with pressure or with any kind of snapping or stretching motions. Unless you're a chiropractor, you don't want to do anything abrupt. And if it hurts, you probably shouldn't be doing it. A degree of amateur proficiency in this field does not give you the right to give health care advice or to diagnose. This is a professional quality treatment, and it's one I use in my own practice. It's great to use with your family and friends. But when in doubt, don't until you've conferred with a trained health professional. You will also need some kind of table. If you work on the floor, it's going to do your body more harm than it does anyone else's good. You may not be in a position to purchase a portable professional quality table like this one, but you're going to need some kind of surface that's approximately palm height, flat, level, not too wide so that you can reach over it. And with some kind of padding on it for comfort, you'll find that foam padding or a folded sleeping bag will do just fine. I prefer to use a twin flat sheet for a drape, just covering the table with it. And then I have my friend or client lie on top of the sheet, bringing the edges in over the body for a drape rather than using an extra piece like a towel. It's more private. It's warmer. It's a little more elegant that way. You can also add other layers, like an electric blanket underneath the sheet. 
And I usually, in my own practice, just explain to people how the drape works, and then I leave the room and they can get on the table in privacy. I also use a bolster pillow under the ankles when the person's lying on the stomach, under the knees when lying on the back. As you can see, the tools of the trade are very simple, and the most important of them are this, this, and these. The movements of Swedish massage consist of effleurage, which is how we apply the oil to a body part as we start working with it, and it's just how we say hello and goodbye to a given part of the body. Kneading, just squeezing the muscles and pulling them away from the bone. Petrissage, a circular drilling for oil movement. We don't slide on the skin, it's just working deep beneath the skin with the fingers or the thumbs. Tapotement, or tapotement if you don't speak French, which is a percussive movement meant to stimulate the circulatory and nervous systems. And after the final effleurage, frequently we'll end with what we call a feather stroke, just lightly stroking, drawing toward the extremities. Now you notice that the way I'm using my own body, I'm not just using my arm muscles, because how you use your body will have a great deal of impact on both how the work feels to the client and how you feel as well. So what I do, instead of squatting, a lot of people have seen a lot of martial art movies and think that you should walk like a duck when you do this work, but rather I put one foot in front of the other, both of them parallel, and use the front leg as a fulcrum. I keep that knee straight rather than bending into it so that it won't make me tired. And then the movement comes out of the back heel, so I'm bringing the body over the body of the client and initiating that movement with the leg muscles. This will affect not only the quality of your touch, but also allow you to work without getting fatigued yourself. We begin the massage proper with the pelvic lean. Got the heels of my hands right up above the pelvis on the crest of the ilium. I'm not using my muscles. I'm, I've just got my feet back far enough that I can use my body weight leaning into this part of the body and stretch the lower back. And this is also a good time to take a moment just to tune into the movements of your friend's breathing and perhaps even coordinate your own with it. I come around to the side without breaking contact, and that's another important concept for massage therapy is to avoid breaking contact whenever possible. That's one reason to keep your oil bottle where you can reach it. Because if you break contact, it's a bit like putting a baby down and picking it back up again repeatedly. Now I start the rock of the pelvis with my hands on the bony protuberances of the hip joints here. And I'm just sort of tossing the pelvic area back and forth from one hand to the next. I'm not imposing a rhythm on it. I'm letting it have its own natural rhythm like a car that you're rocking out of a snowbank. Come up to the shoulders, down to the feet, back up. And now I put one hand on the other side of the shoulder, moving the hands in opposition so that I can kind of twist the spine, and then reversing the hand position, still not interrupting the rhythm. and then moving back down to the feet, where the movement becomes longitudinal, still without interrupting the rhythm. But now I'm doing the heel push. Now to start the back of the legs, first I take the drape away from the right leg all the way up to the waist. Now there's a reason why I start with the right leg. I always want to be consistent, first of all, so that toward the end of a long day, I might not find myself wondering if I've done both legs or done one leg or what have you. And uh, I choose the right leg in particular because the right side is the dominant side of the body on most people. And also the, the treatment is knit together in such a way that you can avoid as much extraneous movement around the table as possible. So we have all the little parts fitting together in a sequence. I begin with the effleurage to apply the oil to the leg, starting down at the heel with the right hand leading because that's the shoulder position that I've adopted, with the hands reaching all the way around the leg 
coming up to the buttock, doing a circle outward on the buttock, lifting the right hand, just like hand over hand on a steering wheel, and coming back down, still holding the hand so that they're reaching all the way around the leg. And that brings us to another important concept, that of lonely spots. If I just use my hands on the top surface here, and then when she's on her back, do the same thing on the other side of the leg, I'm going to leave a whole strip along here that never got touched that we call a lonely spot. And that's why we want to reach around with our hands and get as complete contact as possible. Now friction, first longitudinally, just right on the surface of the skin to get it warm. I come to the side to do the ring, which is sort of like what we called the Indian berm when we were kids. And now I'm ready to cross the thumbs, and I place them on either side of the heel. And I work the attachment of the Achilles tendon there on the heel. And as I work up into the tendon, and the tendon starts to flatten out into muscle, the thumbs flatten out. And I keep them very long and flat and at right angles to the surface of the skin here so that it's not pokey, it's not too specific. And as I come up into the knee, I let off on the pressure and I don't want to use too much friction. That's a very tender skin, it's a very tender area. And repeat. Now you notice I leave one hand here as I bring the other hand back so that we're not breaking contact, we're stepping. That's one way to maintain your contact. And we'll repeat this motion three times as well. Then I lift up the ankle, give it a little bit of a shake to make sure that it isn't being held rigidly. Half sit on the table, and I rest the foot against my shoulder. Now, we don't have any oil on this side of the foot yet, so you don't have to worry about getting it on your shirt. Now I'm going to do a hand over hand, which is basically an effleurage. And again, I'm stepping in order to avoid breaking contact. Now I knead, and this means I'm squeezing as I push down toward the knee. Lifting the muscle away from the bone, squeezing, and I'm squeezing toward the knee. Remember, we're trying to help the blood move toward the heart. So this sort of motion always goes toward the core of the body. Then petrissage. I brace my thumbs on the shin, sort of like on a cello neck or a guitar neck. I curl the fingers around so that they're coming back straight toward me. They're right perpendicular to the surface here. And then I cover the whole area with little circles. I'm not sliding on the skin. I cover the area by working a given spot and then moving to the next one, lifting the fingers up slightly. Now, rather than repeating this movement several times, I try to do it very thoroughly once, because that way I can avoid perhaps missing the same spot several times. I just do it very completely and thoroughly one time through. And then I come out the same way I came in, kneading, and then the effleurage. And now you can ask your friend to take a good deep breath as you reach right under the pelvis. And then as the exhalation comes, you just pull down the front part of the thigh as you stretch the foot. You notice I've got the toes, so I get all of those muscles. And then gently set the leg down. And you want to make sure that the leg always feels supported so that your friend doesn't feel that she has to hold it up using the muscles. Now I'm going to work the back of the leg, the back of the knee, starting just with a thumb over thumb motion, kind of like twiddling your thumbs. And again, being very careful in this area. It's rather sensitive. And then on the sides of the knees, I'm doing a circular motion with the fingertips right around the axis of the knee joint. And you notice that the motion is just like that of a wheel or bicycle pedals moving forward. If I go back this way, it doesn't feel quite right. And you'll also notice that I'm using the whole body to do that. I'm not just standing there using my arm muscles. I'm moving my upper body with the legs stabilized. Then I come to the side and I twist the knee joint. Now, this isn't quite like the friction was. I'm more working beneath the surface than just applying friction to the top of it. And then starting with the inner third of the thigh, I'm going to knead, just like we did in this area. Again, squeezing as I move toward the heart. Then I'll do the same thing in the middle surface of the back of the thigh, carrying it clear back up over the buttock. We want to overlap as much as we possibly can. And when I do the outer third, I reverse 
my right hand to bring the thumb on top so that I can kind of get in there a little better. Again, carrying it clear up over the buttock. And then with my fingers curled on the inner surface of the thigh, the first thing I do is just jiggle those muscles without breaking contact. Then I start to let the fingers come up into a tapo tma movement. Roll the hands over to the sides, to the little finger sides, using a very loosely curled fist because that's going to give me more surface than having the fingers extended. And then covering the entire surface of the leg, just being careful not to bang on the back of the knee. We do tapo tma. I finish down at the foot because that way I can initiate my final effleurage. Finishing with a feather stroke, just lightly with the fingertips. Drape this leg, come around to the other side, and we do the same thing. And this time I'm going to move a little bit more closely to what, I, what my normal speed is as I work. First the effleurage, this time with the left hand leading. And we keep up a fairly brisk pace when we're really doing this massage because it is a fluid pump. And you know what happens when you try to pump your bicycle tires up slowly. Nothing. Friction. Crossing the thumbs on the Achilles attachment. Working up the back of the muscle, letting the thumbs flatten out so that the pressure isn't too specific. Repeating the movement like most of them three times. It's a good number, not just in religion. Again, sitting on the table, resting the foot against the shoulder, hand over hand, kneading. Bracing the thumbs in order to do the petrissage with the fingertips, covering the whole surface of the calf. And then again, kneading hand over hand. Have your friend take a good deep breath, and with the exhalation, pull the hand down the front of the thigh as you stretch those muscles all the way up at the toes. Gently set the leg down. Working the back of the knee with the thumbs. Again, the thumbs are very flat. You don't want it pokey here circles on the sides of the knee joint, twisting, and then the knee. First the inner surface of the thigh, and notice as I squeeze and pull the muscles away from the bone, I'm moving toward the heart, and I'm not rotating those muscles. I'm simply squeezing and moving toward the heart. Middle section of the thigh, up over the buttock, outer section, again, turning the hand that's toward the head so that the thumb will be facing up. And now we jiggle the thigh again using the fingertips, curled fingertips, letting them start to come up in alternation, rolling the hands over to the sides, little finger sides, and then top out the entire leg, including the sole of the foot, laying off a bit on the back of the knee, and then stopping down at the foot end so that we can do our final effleurage. Don't be afraid to walk with that movement. You don't have to keep your feet in one place. Finishing with another feather stroke. Undrape the other leg for the double leg effleurage, starting with the fingertips toward the center, coming up over the buttocks, and then back down with the fingertips on the outside. Repeat that. And then the double leg feather stroke. And that's the legs.
now the back. The first affleurage is going to start with the fingertips pointing outward and the heels of the hands in, right up on the shoulders. And I mean on top of the shoulders as if she were standing. And the first thing I'm going to do is rotate the heels of the hands outward. And then the thumbs will come right into that channel between the scapula and the clavicle, coming in to the spinal muscles. And then they're going to go right down next to the spine as my fingertips reach out as far as they can to avoid lonely spots. To the tip of the tailbone, the tips of the fingers swing in so they can cover the entire buttock region, and as I pull up, they reach all the way down to the sheet so that I don't miss any area. Repeating the same thing, we're pushing the shoulders down toward the feet, thumbs down through that channel, down along the, the sides of the spine, sweeping in, coming back out again. Now after two of those, I'm going to start the spinal jiggle. It starts exactly the same way, but I reach up to the highest vertebra I can feel. There's something called the spinous process, a bone that sticks out at the back. I jiggle it left and right. I step down to the next one, jiggle it left and right, step down to the next one. It's a very precise movement, left, right, left, right, and then step down to the next one. And I do that all the way down the spine. What I'm doing is I'm making the entire spine rotate a little bit, only I'm starting that movement on just one spinous process, so it's torquing those joints between the vertebrae a bit. Now I do one more effleurage, the third one, stepping around to the side for the floor polisher, one hand on top of the other. I'm moving counterclockwise so that I won't be pushing her shoulder up into her ear. I bring those circles all the way down to the buttock, cross over to the other, and as I get up to the other shoulder, to the right shoulder, I reverse direction, so I'm going clockwise. That way, again, I'm not pushing her shoulder up into her ear. Figure eight to reverse directions again. And you notice my whole body, again, is participating in this movement rather than just muscling everything around. A third repetition with the figure eight. And then the same circles, doesn't matter which direction, coming all the way down the spine. And then I'm ready for the swim. The fingertips come all the way around to touch the sheet on both sides. And you notice I have to turn my own body in order to allow that to take place. I'm moving all the way up over the shoulders, coming back down again, all the way down to the sheet, back up again. And this one's going to be asymmetrical, so we can stop at the neck, where I'm going to give the neck a nice little puppy dog squeeze to do the ski and slide. The ski part, I make a peace sign. I karate chop it with the left hand to apply pressure and come all the way down with the fingers on either side of the spine. And the slide part, one hand on top of the other, back up again, knead the neck once more. Ski. Slide. And now I will start to tapote the spine, starting at the sacrum. In alternation, as I come out on the shoulders, I go back into unison. Alternate again. Unison. And here, I deliberately break contact for a moment. Now we do the effleurage, a heart-shaped effleurage of the buttocks, up and out. And then the buttock punch. I just stabilize that tissue with one hand, make a fist, and as I rotate the fist, push that tissue into that hand. Now, I'll move both hands around a bit so as to cover the entire area. I can get the other side without having to change sides. I don't have to walk around the table. And now with the thumbs, I'm going to petrissage the sacrum, a kind of shovel-shaped bone at the back of the pelvis, covering that whole area, and then bringing the thumbs out just below the lip of the iliac crest, which is the top of the pelvis. I'll repeat that petrissage again. Now I'm going to come along the top edge of the iliac crest, repeat it again with the lower rim, the upper rim. I'm now finished with the buttock area, so I'll repeat that effleurage. 
And now there's something called vertical effleurage. And it's a bit like the effleurage we started the back with, only going the other direction. The thumbs are right up against the spine, fingers reaching all the way out. About halfway up the back, and the heels of the hands rotate and come down between the last rib and the pelvis. Now, you want to make sure you're actually in that area between the last rib and the pelvis. You don't want to push on the 12th rib, the floating rib. And now the shoulders. Now, I happen to have a headrest. If you have a table without a headrest and the client's head is turned to the side, well, if it's turned facing you, you can just reach right across and work that shoulder and still be working the shoulder away from the face. If not, walk around the table yourself because you don't want to have your friend have to turn her head more than once. So I start up at the neck, kneading the shoulder, coming down around the shoulder, right onto the arm, and then I get off the arm, back onto just below the scapula. And you can even repeat that if you want get that area thoroughly. And then I'm going to lift the shoulder with one hand and make sure I'm doing the lifting and not my friend. And then I can get the little finger edge of the other hand under the scapula. Now I come around to the other side because I want to be reaching across the body in order to get that shoulder. Starting at the neck again. Coming around the shoulder. I said you can even repeat it. Then lifting the shoulder with one hand and coming under with the little finger edge of the scapula. Now I'm ready for the thousand hands. I'm just pulling up with enough friction to kind of pull the body up slightly. I come all the way down to the buttock area and back up again. And I'm going to come around. Now this turn can be a little tricky at first, but it's really great when it works. Come all the way around the side you're standing on and then just turn the one hand so that both are pulling straight up and then step your body the rest of the way around so that the other hand will turn come back down to the bottom of the buttock area back up again same thing and by making that turn smoothly enough you can really get a nice deceptive sense of continuity finishing on this side so that you do each side the same number of times. I am just pulling up with both hands here, and I'm ready for the normalizing stroke. This hand goes down right next to the spine, and then it comes back up on the side as the other one descends. So you see the longitudinal movement here is in opposition. But the both hands are moving left and right at the same time. Now we finish with the same effleurage with which we began. And again, I'm using my weight here. And watch your own breath, too. Make sure you aren't holding your breath as you work or bringing your shoulders up around your ears. We're now finished with the back. We'll cover this side of the body completely. And then starting again with the right side, as we always do, uncover the entire right side of the body. We're going to start what's just like the effleurage on the back of the leg. But when we get up to the buttocks, we simply keep going, do the same circles we did on the buttock, only this time on the shoulder. And as we come back down, one hand on the arm, one on the trunk, and then when you run out of hand, they come back together and finish exactly like the effleurage of the back of the leg. Let's repeat that once more. And now a full body feather stroke on this side. Covering the right side of the body. Same thing, exactly like the effleurage of the back of the leg, continuing on to the shoulder with the circles moving outward, downward. Another repetition. Full body feather stroke, covering up that side, and now cupping the hands, we're going to do clapping or cupping on the back of the body, covering the entire surface, 
And now we fluff up the aura. I don't mean to impose any metaphysical systems on anybody, but there is an energy field around the body, which you can notice just by walking up to a television and noticing that you don't have to touch it before you distort the picture, smoothing it down. And you will find after a bit that you can feel something in your hands, even though you're not touching the body. And now we're finished with the back side of the body. Having finished with this part of the body, now I want to give my friend a chance to turn over so I can work the other side without violating her privacy. Just for the purposes of the demonstration, I'll step around to the other side of the table. So I simply flip the far side of the sheet off and then hold the near side up so that she can turn over in privacy, scooting down a bit because I'll be removing the headrest. and then lifting your knees up a bit so I can get the bolster pillow right under them. At this point, I'm going to switch over to a male model so that we can see the work both on a female and a male body, although you don't really work them any differently. You just want to make sure that your hands are always responding to the texture of the tissue beneath them. So now we're going to move on to the next part. I begin with the right foot just as with the other parts of the body. And we'll often, if I'm not traveling, use some kind of a cream, a foot cream, rather than oil, since the pores tend to be pretty small on the feet. And if I'm working in a place with public showers, I may even use an athlete's foot remedy just to make sure we don't spread anything from one part of the body to others. The first actual move is the pull down, one hand on top of the foot, one beneath it, just pulling down toward the toes. The first effleurage is almost more like a petrissage. We begin by lifting up the foot with one hand, and between the second joint of the first finger and the thumb, we just work the outside of the heel, right at the very bottom of that attachment on the calcaneus. And then, and you can even drop down on one knee or sit if you want, I'm going to work the bottom of the foot. We call it the plantar aponeurosis. It's a big, wide, flat tendon just spreading and moving upward and outward with the thumbs. And then the thumb walk, which is just poking directly toward the head with the tips of the thumbs covering the entire surface of the sole of the foot. You can even see the head move when you do that. See the nose moving back and forth. And then working the arch of the foot, which in foot reflexology relates to the spine. You can sometimes even find tender areas relating to the part of the spine that may be giving a person trouble. And I use the opposite hand from the foot that I'm working on so that my elbow is able to participate in this. I get kind of a digging motion moving up toward the big toe, finishing at the big toe so that I'm in a position to rotate the toe in both directions, pulling slightly so it doesn't get jammed, and then milking the toe. That means ironing down with a thumb on top and a finger beneath with quite a bit of pressure, and then doing the same thing on the left and right sides. And we do this on each of the toes. And it's very useful to do careful, detailed work on the toes. You, you, one can really feel it if this area is being done sloppily or carelessly. And then taking the corner of the sheet, and I like to start with the smallest toe, I'll pop the toes. Now, I'm not yanking. I'm not uh, grabbing at them. Just pulling backward with my own weight very steadily and then gently rotating the toe as if it were a key in an ignition. I apply tension, and you'll usually be rewarded by a popping sound on at least one or two of them. I wouldn't do this on fingers. I wouldn't want to loosen up those ligaments or possibly create an arthritic problem, but on toes, they're always jammed into shoes anyway, so it's kind of nice to give them a little breathing room. Now I'm going to iron up between the tendons, which in certain parts is also between the bones, all the way up into the top of the ankle joint, We're using the tip of the thumb. I want to be very smooth in here, or else it can feel uncomfortable. And then I'll, with the fingertips, I'll work around the malleoli. These are the two bony projections on either side of the foot that always feel so great when you bash them into something. And then we'll flex and extend the ankle 
And you notice I've got my hand on the toes so that I'm stretching all of those tendons that go down into the toes and the muscles they attach to. And then the same motion rotating. And I keep my hand flat so that I can keep getting the toes from both directions. Now I'm going to shake the ankle, cupping the malleoli with the heels of the hands, and then just moving in opposition so that the foot moves back and forth like the tail of a happy dog. And then stepping around so I'm facing the other direction, I'm going to break the arches. Now that's a concave motion in two planes, kind of stretching the foot. And sometimes it'll crack and pop a bit. And then standing at right angles to the foot, I'll vibrate the foot. That's one hand on top, one on the bottom, and it's sort of like building a fire with a stick and a board. Now I'm going to repeat my initial effleurage with the thumbs. And the pull down. And you can finish with a feather stroke. And now moving to the left foot, we'll do precisely the same thing. Pull down, and you can apply the oil or the cream that way if you want. Working the heel between the thumb and the second joint of the first finger. Spreading the, the plantar aponeurosis, the sole of the foot, with the thumbs, working upward and outward. And you can use a fair degree of pressure here. Thumb walk, and again, watching the entire body move longitudinally. And the arch. And I'm using my left hand so that that thumb has a bit of leverage as I work up toward the big toe. Rotating and milking the toe. Popping the toes using the corner of the sheet. Ironing up between the tendons. Working the fingertips around the malleoli. And in the usual direction, over the top and back under the bottom. Flexing and extending the ankle joint. And it's better to do few repetitions, perhaps even just one of each, and do it thoroughly than a lot of movement. Now we're rotating the ankle joint, and again, the flat hand, so I can really involve those toes in that movement. Cupping the malleoli to shake the ankle. Stepping about to break the arch. And then standing here at right angles to the table to vibrate the foot, and then our final effleurage, pull down, feather stroke, and we're now done with the feet. Now we move to the right leg. And using this drape, it's possible to uncover only the leg and to protect your friend's privacy with the edge of the other side of the sheet. Our first effleurage starts off very much like the effleurage on the back of the leg. Again, the left hand is leading. And of course, I'm beginning on the right leg. And as I come up to the end of the leg, my right hand just parks here. The left hand reaches under the lower back and works the muscles just on the right side of the spine, or my left, doing circles. And the circles are going in this direction, clockwise. Then I do a hand over hand, pulling up over the hip, 
and then back down again not letting my hands fall asleep and get sloppy even though I'm reducing the pressure somewhat coming clear up off the toes You can do friction here, it's optional uh, by this point. If the person isn't warm, you're probably not working in a good place. But it's not bad to warm up the skin a bit. Same thing that we did on the back. Longitudinally on the way up and ringing on the way down. Now we use the heels of the hands on either side of the shin bone, just pushing down into the muscle. And I try to have the heels of the hands pretty much parallel to the bone here so that it's not becoming narrow and more specific. I want that to be fairly general because these attachments can be rather tender. And now a thumb coming up right on that margin where the muscle and the bone meet. And again, this area can be sort of tender. And you notice I'm using the thumb that crosses over there so that I can stabilize my hand with the other fingers. I'll repeat that same movement on the other side of the bone. And it may take a little practice to feel exactly where that place is and not be up on the bone or down into the muscle. We're right on the edge between the two. Now I'm going to lift up the knee. And again, you always want to make sure the leg or any body part feels supported when you lift it up so that it doesn't tighten up. I'll cover the foot up with the sheet so that I can sit on the foot slightly to stabilize it without getting oil in my pants. And now a hand over hand coming up the back of the calf right into the knee joint. Then the hands come up behind the knee, and the fingers can link together, if you like, or just one over the other, over the top of the knee, down the top of the leg. I'm going to reach under with the fingertips curled, and I'm going to rake up the back of the leg into the knee. Now I'm going to repeat the hand over hand again. Again, up over the knee. This time I'm going to rake up the sides of the leg. Hand over hand up over the knee. And to do the top of the leg, we simply interlace the fingers, and then you can get a lot more tension and resistance than you could just digging in with your fingers. One last time, hand over hand up the calf, over the knee, and now we vibrate the thigh. Carefully setting the leg back down. Now it's time to work on the front of the knee. And we're going to do circles, starting at the top of the knee and pulling outward, and just moving around the patella, the kneecap. And now circles on the sides of the knee. And relative to my own body, the direction is the same as it was working on the back of the knee. Relative to the knee, it's reversed. But it seems that the movement of my body makes more difference than anything as far as what that feels like. Now I step to the side and twist the joint, just as we did when we were working on the back of the knee, and the knee and so forth is also basically the same. On the inner surface of the thigh, squeezing as I move up toward the heart, same thing on the middle portion of the thigh, the outer portion, again, reversing the hand positions of the thumb of the hand that's toward the head is up toward the top. I can get in there a little more easily that way. And again, jiggling the inner thigh using the fingertips letting them come up one at a time. And then the hands are rolling over onto the little finger side in a loosely curled fist because there's more surface striking than if it were a flat hand. Covering the entire area, I'm not banging on the shin bone. I'm not hitting the knee. You can get the foot from both sides as you can the calf here. And again, finishing at the foot so you can commence your final effleurage. Reaching under the back, circles going this direction. Feather stroke. And that's the right leg. So the same thing on the right leg.
And again, being careful with the draping. It's always wise to be conservative. You never know what people's feelings are about that sort of thing. Applying the oil with the first effleurage, moderate pressure because you don't want to leave all the oil at one end of the leg. Your first effleurage is mostly just to get the oil off the hands and onto the body. Again, the circles, this time going this direction. Optional friction. Heels of the hands coming down on either side of the shin bone. And then the thumb coming up along the shin bone. You notice that's clear over here where the muscle meets the bone. and using the thumb that crosses over the bone so you can brace the hand with the other fingers. And again, lifting up the leg, putting the sheet over the foot so you can stabilize it by sitting on it. Hand over hand, up the calf, over the knee, raking up the back of the thigh. Reach down as far as you can. Over the knee, raking up the sides. And just the motion of your hands coming up will stabilize the leg even when you're at the bottom. And now coming up the top of the thigh, the fingers interlaced, and vibrating the thigh. Set the leg back down again. And we're ready to do the knee. Circles in opposite directions, starting pulling the thumbs away from each other above the kneecap. And then circles on the sides of the knee. Turning to the side to do the ring, the twist of the kneecap. Really focusing on the joint under the skin more than the skin. And now the need. First the inner surface of the thigh, squeezing as you push up toward the heart. The middle surface of the thigh. And then the outer surface, reversing the hand position of the right hand so that the thumb is upward. And then, again, jiggling. First with the fingertips, just moving the flesh without breaking contact with it. Coming up in alternation. Going over onto the sides of the hands, little finger sides, using a loosely clenched fist. Stopping down at the foot to commence the final effleurage. Feather stroke. And that's the legs. Now you notice as we get to the abdomen, we're standing on the left side of the body because we've just finished doing the left leg. And that means that as we work on the abdomen, it's easy to work in the direction that the large intestine goes without getting pokey. Now the first movement, which is essentially an effleurage, we call the sun and the moon. And the reason for it is the way it's shaped. We've got the left hand doing continuous circles in the lower abdomen and the right hand joining it in an arc, just lifting up the right hand for each revolution. Now in the large intestines, we do one that's called the I love you, and the reason for that is the way it's shaped as well. First, you're just coming down the descending colon, and I'm stepping. I move one hand at a time so I don't break contact. And then coming across, the transverse colon and down the descending colon. And then up the ascending colon, across the transverse colon and down the descending colon. 
And that's the name of the stroke. I, L, and U. Here's the I part, the L part, and the U part. Just a mnemonic device. To work the rest of the area here, we do what's called cat's paws. It's just like when cats are going to sleep. They gently put their paws into whatever surface that is. And to get the small intestine area right in the center, we're using the thumbs. Very flat, not pokey. Kind of sidestepping the navel and not coming up too far under the ribs because it gets a little tender in that area. And now working under the costal arch. Costal means rib. It's just the arch right under the ribs here where the diaphragm is. We'll stabilize the stomach muscle right here with one thumb. And then the other thumb comes down under the ribs. And you're doing that with the exhalation so that you can get your thumb in there. And also very careful not to snag that 12th rib down here. You want to make sure you come out low enough so you don't grab the floating ribs. Same thing on this side. And then we'll do both sides simultaneously. Reaching under on the last one, all the way to the spine. Then you can jiggle the fingers as you come out into the swim. Same thing we did on the back, going down between the pelvis and the chest. And we finish with one hand up here on the rib, on the upper ribs, and then the finger just above the pubic bone, the hand comes up in what's called the scoop, rotating as it comes out here. Now the reason for that rotation, we're not actually changing directions, making a turn. We're simply rotating the heel of the hand so that it can fit up under there instead of catching on the sides. And this hand is here just to stabilize and so that you don't break contact. You can keep from breaking contact by simply leaving one hand in contact with the body as you move the other one. From there, we go right back into the sun and the moon, the effleurage. And we're ready to move on to the chest. We do the chest staying on the same side of the table. The initial effleurage, the ascending effleurage, we come up the center of the chest with both hands, coming out on the shoulders, spreading them down and out into the table, coming down the sides of the rib cage. We stay on the rib cage. We don't come down onto the abdomen here, but we try to cover not only the whole shoulder, but the side of the chest here. First three fingers of the left hand petrissage the sternum. And then you're coming up and out the clavicles, the shoulder bones, collar bones, with both hands. Fingertips above the clavicle, thumbs below. Stepping around to the side of the table, to the corner, using the thumbs to come into the pectoral muscles. You want to keep those thumbs nice and flat. You don't want to be poking into those muscles. They're going to be quite tender in that area. Same thing on the other side, stepping around to the other corner. And then we move down toward the feet. So as we do the breast circles, coming in with the crotch of the thumb, it will be moving upward, not downward or sideward. Not coming over the nipple, stopping. And you can do the same thing on the other side without moving your body position. Then we go into the thousand hands, just the same thing that we were doing on the back. And as we did in the back, ending with both hands on top of the shoulders. And you flip them around so that you can do the chest circles. We're staying up above the breast area, we're up on the shoulder, on the muscle. And this is forcing the residual air, the tidal air, out of the lungs. Now the descending effleurage, down the sternum, modeling the edge of the ribs 
with the thumbs, coming up the side of the chest, again spreading the shoulders down into the table. Hands come in for a repeat. And on that final effleurage, you can come on down the arms to finish. And then you're in position to start on the right arm. We begin with the right arm. And applying the oil with the first effleurage as usual, in order to avoid bringing the shoulder up into the ear, with the right hand we hold the wrist and then the left hand can go on up to the shoulder with the arm stabilized. The left hand holds the shoulder and then the right hand can come on up and join it, circles around the shoulder, somewhat like what we did on the buttock on the effleurage at the back of the leg. And then both hands come down, clear down to the fingertips. Repeat. Friction is optional again. And now with the heels of the hands, we're going to spread the back of the hand and then come down between the bones, the metacarpals, with the thumb on the back of the hand, fingertip on the palm of the hand. Rotating, milking the fingers, hanging onto the second joint and giving a little bit of tension as you rotate the finger both directions so that you won't jam it. Milking on the sides and the top and bottom. And although the direction of these movements is not toward the heart, there just isn't that much blood in this area and we're mostly trying to avoid jamming the fingers or the wrist. We turn the hand over, and you take the hands with the two middle fingers together, bring those fingers between the thumb and the first finger, and then the little finger goes between the first and the second finger. Same thing with the right hand, coming between the little finger and the ring finger. So you've got the whole hand spread open. Then you can work the palm, even up into the wrist if you can reach it, with the thumbs, petrissaging. You can work pretty deeply. There's a palmar aponeurosis, a big, thick, tendinous sheet across the palm of the hand, just as there is on the sole of the foot. We finish this by stretching the fingers and bringing the hand up so that you're stretching at the wrist as well, since all of those tendons go through the wrist. And vibrating the arm, you can bring the hands down the arm and back up again. And as we drain the forearm, I keep the forearm more or less perpendicular, so as I push down with the thumb on the inner surface, alternating one hand after the other. I'm not going to be moving the arm inward. I'll just be forcing the elbow down into the table. And I lift the arm, I half sit on the table, covering my leg with the sheet to protect my trousers, and then do what we call the elbow screw. It's just the hand rotating on the point of the elbow. And then we're in position to knead the upper arm. We can't really do that much in the way of direction because the shoulder is so mobile, but just make sure that all of those muscles are getting worked. We set the arm back down, coming around right to the corner of the table, reaching under with the fingertips right to the edge of the scapula. And I'm gonna pull my hand out with the hand resting on the table and the finger is simply curling like this. So it little shake that shoulder. I leave my left hand sitting there right underneath the shoulder with the elbow low so that I can rest his arm on top of my arm. Then I can work in here in the armpit area, get all those muscles there. Not a lot of friction, not a lot of pressure. That skin is tender in that area. Then I reach down as far as I can, pull up. The two hands join into a stretch all the way off onto the fingers. Then I just dangle the elbow. Now if the client or friend wants to hold that elbow straight, rather than resisting that movement, just support the elbow and then it'll let go and you can just sort of dangle it like a pendulum as you come on in. 
in position for the final effleurage, exactly like the effleurage with which we began. Finishing with a feather stroke. And now the left arm. Another way you can apply the oil is just to pull down once, getting the oil off the hands onto the arm. And again for the effleurage, holding the wrist, this time with the left hand, the right hand comes up to the shoulder, stabilizes the shoulder, left hand comes up and meets it, circles around the shoulder and then pulling both hands down. And just as we stressed on the leg, being certain that the fingers and the thumbs reach all the way around so that we cover the entire surface. You can even lift it a bit as you come down to the fingertips. Now spreading the back of the hand with the heels of your own hands and working down through between the metacarpals, the thumb on the back of the hand and the finger on the palm, squeezing as you work your way down and coming all the way off onto the last bit of the webbing between the two fingers. Now rotating the fingers, starting with the thumb and milking, pulling slightly and holding at the second joint so that you don't jam the finger or the knuckle. Turning the hand over, and the two middle fingers between the thumb and the first finger, and on the other hand, between the little finger and the ring finger, petrissaging the palm with the thumbs, getting the entire area. You can use a lot of depth. Coming up onto the wrist, if you can reach it. And as we stretch the fingers, stretching the hand, too. Now a vibrate of the forearm. And as you drain the forearm with the thumb coming down, if you watch the fingers, you can see that you're affecting those muscles and their tendons as the fingers straighten and curl again. Now lifting the elbow, putting the sheet over your own leg, the elbow screw, just using the thumb end of the hand to get that area. Kneading the muscles of the forearm, of the upper arm. Putting the arm back where it was, stepping around to be able to reach under the shoulder to the edge of the scapula, and then lifting with the fingers to jiggle the shoulder as you pull on out, leaving the right hand in contact Left hand reaches down, lays the arm over the forearm, keeping the floor, the elbow down low enough that it's almost parallel to the floor. Working the muscles under the armpit region. Reaching all the way down, pulling up into a stretch. And then just letting the arm dangle, swinging it a bit like a pendulum as you bring it back down to its normal position. And we repeat the effleurage. Feather stroke. And that's the arms. and shoulders are moved to the head of the table. And now that we're getting up near the face and the hair, we want to be very careful with the oil, just to use a couple of drops at the most. And rather than applying it with the effleurage, as we usually do to save extra movement, make sure that you spend a moment really getting that oil off the hands and onto the shoulder and neck, keeping it out of the hair. 
And I reach across and lift this one shoulder, rolling the body slightly so I can get the other arm under there. And then I can lift with that hand to get this hand under, and I'm going to pull them both out with a motion like this to kind of jiggle the spine. Getting up to the neck, just kind of pulling on it, lengthening and stretching it. Now I'm going to cradle the head between the two hands with the thumb and the first finger right around the ear, so I'm not on the ear, not applying pressure to it. So I pull gently and set the head down on the left side with my hand keeping the ear up off the table. Then I'm in position to do my first effleurage. I've got my fingertips on top of the neck and my thumb down below. And I just come down the neck, out on the shoulder, pivot around so the thumb comes to the top, the fingers go to the bottom, pull back up again, and my thumb and then my first finger drag along behind the ear here. And then the first finger comes in front of the ear and the second finger behind it, and they straddle it till we get past the ear. Pivoting on those two fingers, I drop the thumb and repeat. Now I'm going to petrissage little circles along the base of the skull, the occipital ridge, a part of the occiput bone at the bottom where the muscles of the neck and spine attach. And I'm coming all the way around almost to the other ear. And back. Now I start to do larger circles, very shallow circles, because there's some very flat, thin muscles here, the platysma, for instance. And I'm going to be avoiding a couple of areas. I'm not going to come farther forward than this muscle here, the sternocleidomastoid. There are a lot of delicate structures in here as well as right below the ear that you don't want to touch. So we stay back on the neck and away from the throat. And I let these circles come around the back of the neck and even reach under the spine a bit. Now you may find your fingers getting caught in a little fold of skin as you reach down under the back and just disentangle them and come on back. It's a good place right on the seventh cervical vertebra, the one that kind of sticks out and back, the last neck vertebra. Then. I come down with my hand in the same position it was in on the way up with the effleurage. The thumbs on top, fingers are beneath. I come down to the shoulder, and this time I just fake a turn in, and then I come back. Then pulling out a bit, I straighten the fingers and the wrist and hand, bracing my elbow against my hip, and I put the fingertip right in there between the clavicle and the scapula, and I petrissage little circles coming into the neck, raking up the back of the neck with the fingertips curved, and then petrissage in toward the ear and then come around the ear with the fingers, just as I've done in the other moves, and repeat. And it's an easy transition from that back into the effleurage. I simply drop the thumb instead of diving the fingers down, pivoting on the fingers. Repeat the effleurage three repetitions. And now again, cradling the head from both sides with the thumb and first finger right around the ear. And again, pulling gently so we don't jam the neck. Bring the head over and lay it down on the right side. Now I can do the effleurage on the left side, starting with my fingers on the top, thumb on the bottom, coming down to the shoulder, rotating around so I come back up with the thumb on top and the fingers on the bottom. Thumb and finger coming around behind the ear. First finger coming down in front of the ear. Second finger behind it. Thumb just dives down, I repeat. Now I'm ready to petrissage little circles along the occipital ridge at the base of the skull, all those muscle attachments. A lot of headaches hang out in there. Coming back up, you notice we're kind of redundant the way we work this area over and over again because it's so important. Now larger, shallow circles along the side of the neck. Coming back around, back of the neck and reaching all the way under, along the spine. And now coming down the neck with the thumb on top, fingers on the bottom, faking a turn, coming back around, sweeping the fingers back, straightening the fingers, hand and wrist, Bracing my elbow against my hips so that I can petrissage little circles coming in 
to the neck, raking up the back of the neck, petrissaging along the occipital ridge to the ear, and then around the ear to repeat. Down to the shoulder, fake another turn. Petrissage into the neck, rake up the neck. Petrissage over to the ear. Third and final repeat. And from the same position, just drop the thumb and I'm in position for the effleurage. Now again, placing the left hand on the head so that I can gently pulling, bring the head back to center. Now when I do the face, rather than using oil, I usually like to use some kind of cream. And often I'll use a sunscreen because most of us are getting a little more sun on our faces than we need to. Again, very sparing, we want to keep it out of the hair. So we start by simply sliding the hands outward along the face, spreading it, and then coming back in, squishing it. Make some wonderful faces. Now I'm going to model the chin, the thumbs above the chin, fingers below it, just working my way out to the ears. And then with a couple of fingers, just doing stripes moving outward and upward across the face. You can even put your first and second fingers on either side of the mouth as you pull out. And as you work your way up further, you can bring your fingers down along the wings of the nose and then kind of working up under the cheekbones there. When we get up to the ears, just squeezing and pulling on both ears simultaneously, trying to cover the entire ear surface, even the flap in front of the ear. And then you can simply hold the flap of the ear and close the ears for a moment, giving silence. Sometimes that'll be the first time you really see a full breath in a treatment is when you create that feeling of silence. And now around the lower edge of the eye socket, I use the middle finger of each hand because it's the longest one, just gently pressing points all the way along that bony ridge, pointing away from the eyeball itself. You can even carry that out across the temple and even behind the ear. Same thing on the upper ridge. And repeat each of those if you wish. And as long as your friend doesn't have contact lenses, it's a good idea to check at the beginning, you can just take the thumbs gently across the eyeballs and again out across the temples. Now with the thumbs, we're going to petrissage little circles coming out across the forehead, and then starting with the thumbs and then using the fingers, just scrubbing with the fingertips. As long as you keep lifting the fingers up to move them, you won't be messing the hair up too much. It's a little bit like drying your hair with a towel after a shower. And then moving the head to the side, just as we did to work on the side of the neck, again cradling that ear, you can get the back of the head from each side. And bringing the head back to center, you can gently pull on the hair, just pulling the scalp away, a little bit away from the head.
And that is a Swedish massage. Once you've learned the material in this tape well enough that you can perform the massage without any prompting, practice it over and over and over again. Mastery only comes from having practiced something enough times that you reach that exquisite point of boredom when you know that you've really learned the material thoroughly. And I suggest really mastering this form before you start to perhaps throw it in with other things that you might know. This is a professional treatment. It's one that I use in my practice, but having learned it does not make you a professional. And if you would like to enter the field, please give yourself and the field and your future clients the respect of going through a professional training program. There are already plenty of people out there calling themselves massage therapists who don't have any training. The American Massage Therapy Association has already approved the curricula of over 50 schools, and to find out the name and location of a school near you, you can contact the AMTA education director. I hope you've enjoyed working with this tape and have learned some valuable skills. The world can't possibly have enough skilled, caring contact. <laughs>